Uh, if you brought your Bible today or you have your electronic device or you want to just sit there and use the screens, we make it so easy for you around here. <laughs> uh, open your Bibles to 1 Peter, find chapter 3, 1 Peter chapter 3, and uh, we're going to be looking at verse 18 again. You remember about two weeks ago, uh, we started a short series on the cross, and really this is our main text, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, and we're going to look at one phrase there. We took a phrase a couple of weeks ago, and we're going to look at another phrase today, and then I want to do something that I hope doesn't short-circuit your circuitry there in your mind and in your heart. I want you to find a second passage, okay? Everybody, almost everybody has a ribbon like, like this, and so find 2 Corinthians and uh, find chapter 5, 2 Corinthians, find chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to be looking actually at verses 17 through 21 today, and really the 2 Corinthian passage is our main passage today. We're doing what's called topical exposition. I know none, none of you, well maybe that'll bless you a little bit, but you can go and impress, impress somebody uh, when they said, what did your pastor do today? He did some topical exposition. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, um, that's where you pull a topic from a particular passage like uh, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, and then you, you exposit a text that clarifies that particular passage. And so our main text is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and following. Everybody good? All right, I hope I've given you enough time. You deacons, if you're still looking for it, just act like you found it, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so 1 Peter chapter 3 and uh, verse 18, here's what Peter said, okay? Verse 18, for Christ also has, and your translation says there, died, like the New American Standard, or your translation actually might say suffered right there, right? For Christ also suffered for sins, or he died for sins, once for all, the just for the unjust so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Now, I told you a couple of weeks ago that this is the Mount Everest of passages that deal with, specifically, the cross of Christ. You've got encapsulated in that one verse so many thoughts about what Christ Jesus did for us on the cross. And of course, you might remember we talked about the doctrine of substitution, the just for the unjust. Well, today, I want to talk to you not about the doctrine of substitution, but I want to talk to you about the doctrine of salvation, and uh, specifically the doctrine of reconciliation. Look down there uh, in verse 18, and look where he says, so that he might do what? Bring us to God. Okay, that's what we're talking about today, the doctrine of reconciliation, so that God might bring us to himself through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and look at what Paul has to say about bringing us to God through Jesus. Verse 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, the old things passed away, behold, new things have come. And I say hallelujah to that. Now, all these things are from God. And I want you to notice here, Paul uses the term reconciled no less than five different times. Reconciliation, reconciled, no, no less than five different times in this text, and this is the first time he uses it. You can't miss the point of the passage here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, all these things are from God, verse 18, who, what? Reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of what? Reconciliation, that's second time, namely that God was in Christ doing what? reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so then we're told how we're reconciled. Verse 21, doesn't get better than this. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's the doctrine of substitution again, by the way. He, 
God the Father made him Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't get closer to the heart of the gospel than when you begin to uh, marinate yourself and meditate on the doctrine of substitution, the fact that Jesus died in our place, the just for the unjust, and the doctrine of reconciliation, verse 1 Peter 3.18, so that he might bring us to God. You don't get any closer to the heart of the gospel than when you are meditating on those two wonderful truths. Uh, this morning in Sunday school, as um, uh, Brother Roy and Sister Carrie were teaching, I couldn't help but just think, as some of you articulated the gospel of Jesus Christ, that at the end of the day, when you understand that salvation is totally freely given to you by grace, that you don't earn it, you don't merit it, you don't do anything to in any way contribute to it, that God gives it to you freely, all you can do in response to that is simply worship God. It just humbles you to the point where you understand that I didn't earn this, I didn't merit it, all I can do is just praise God for His wonderful grace. And it causes you to just worship God, to just thank Him. And it catapults you into service you know so oftentimes we focus in on the service part of it and certainly the response of God's salvation should be us serving but as we talked about in Sunday school and many of you know we don't serve to earn we serve as a result of what God did for us and we serve with a heart that's bowed down to God in worship and it's such a wonderful wonderful thing when you get the 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 the, the gospel in your heart and in your soul, and it just so changes your life. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone gets it, if they understand that they're in Christ and, and His righteousness is yours, he says, you're a new creature. Old things pass away. Behold, all things have become new. And so one of my problems, for example, with any institution like Alcoholics Anonymous, for example, which I'm not criticizing here, but, um, um, but any institution that will tell you that you are an alcoholic, I can look at this verse and say, no, I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not always going to be an alcoholic. I'm not um, under the um, disease of alcoholism, as you would say. This verse says, and Romans 6 said, which we looked at last week, that I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ, that the old burn charrette, that old alcoholic, actually died. Hallelujah. And I, I am now a new creation in Christ. And when you begin to just get a hold of, of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how that transforms you from the inside out and how, how good God is in granting you by grace salvation, it pulls you into a place not only of service, but also of worship. And it just causes you to want to magnify Him and serve Him and worship Him and adore Him forever and ever and ever. And all of a sudden, God becomes more than just a fire escape at the end of your life. All of a sudden, He becomes your treasure. And this intimacy is built between you and your Father. Whereas you cry out now, Abba, Father. And it's no longer just the Creator. It's no longer just God. It's no longer just you using King James English to try to uh, connect with Him through some rote prayer that you've said a thousand times. No, all of a sudden, you lay all that aside and it's just you and your Father and you worship Him and you adore Him and you magnify Him in awe and in reverence of who He is. And it's just a total life changer when the gospel of Jesus Christ is understood and preached on and stood on. And we will never come to a place in our Christian lives where we will no longer need to think about the doctrines of grace, the doctrines of salvation by grace through faith. And so, uh, as we talk about today, the doctrine of reconciliation, that's a big word, as you know. It simply means to bring together two warring parties. That's when reconciliation takes place. Uh, if you don't know what reconciliation is, you never experienced it, that means that you're probably, you've never been married before. <laughs> and, uh, and so reconciliation means to bring together two warring parties. And that's what we're talking about today. And so you might remember that um, as we read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Paul says we're a new creation. And then he uses the word reconciled or reconciliation, some form of the verb or noun, no less than five different times. And so Paul is letting the Corinthians know 
that you're a new creation in Christ and you've been reconciled. The way Peter second said it in second Peter 318 or in first Peter 318 rather is that that he might bring us to God. And so we need to understand that when it comes to salvation, first of all, we have separation and alienation separation and alienation. Now, you remember uh, going back to the book of Genesis, God created Adam and Eve. And God would come down in the ruach of the day, the cool of the day, and they would have fellowship one with another. You had a holy God approaching innocent man. And they had wonderful, wonderful fellowship together. But you know, in chapter 3, sin entered into the human race. Adam ate of the forbidden fruit. Eve consented to it. Um, she actually ate first, if I remember correctly, and um, then she gave it to Adam. In fact, that's exactly how it happened. Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. She gave it to Adam, and all of a sudden, humanity is then plunged into sin. And so there is a separation at that point between God, who's holy, and man, who, is depra- who, be- who, who becomes a depraved sinner. And it wasn't as if Adam and Eve just plunged themselves into sin. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, the whole cosmos is crying out for redemption. And so everything from the creation uh, to all the way down to the, um, the, the human beings were affected by it, of course, all the way down to even the plant life. And the animals were affected because of the curse of sin. So God comes down in the cool of the day. He's still a holy God. He approaches them by grace. Anytime God comes to you in a sinful, rebellious state, that's grace. And so God comes down in the cool of the day. And Adam and Eve, as you guys have heard me preach numerous times, they run away from God rather than to Him. And why? Because they are ashamed. They try to cover themselves to cover their shame. They know that they're guilty. They know they've broken God's law. And it is absolute depravity for them to run away from God to try to find a place where they can cover themselves rather than coming to God to allow Him by grace to cover them through shed blood. But that's exactly what they uh, did. They ran away from God. And I want you to know the Bible says that that is the state of humanity. We are all descendants of Adam and Eve. Call it original sin. You and I have received something from our original parents, Adam and Eve, uh, called a sin nature. We're depraved. We receive that. All of us are guilty of it. And again, if you don't believe in depravity of sin, that tells me that you've never had a child. (laughs) And uh, you know depravity of sin. You know that you don't have to teach a child to lie or to cheat or to steal or whatever it might be. It's just inherent in our crooked nature. And so, humanity is separated from God. And let me just uh, give you an idea. If Adam and Eve are over here, and they're in this depraved, wicked, sinful state, and a holy God is here, and there's a great chasm between a holy God and unholy man, if Adam and Eve have children, where where will their children be born? They'll be born in the same condition as their parents. And so I want you to know, that's exactly what is passed down to every single human being who's received a sin nature from Adam and Eve. Uh, They receive a sinful nature. And so not only do you have a nature uh, that causes you to sin, you have a proclivity to sin. The very moment you come to an age of accountability where, where you know right from wrong, you will choose wrong. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. We're sinners by nature. We're sinners by willful action. And so therefore, because of that, we're separated from God. And children are born in that condition. They receive a sin nature um, from God. And the Bible goes further to say when we talk about the depravity of man, because listen, one of the reasons that I'm expositing this and making this so clear is because we've got so many people out there that think that they're okay with God or that the fact that they're a sinner, maybe not as bad as others, is not really any big deal. And so everything between them and quote unquote, the man upstairs is okay. But what they don't understand is, is that what the Bible says about the depravity of man and the sinfulness of man and and the way that that separates us from God, it's more than just we've been bad little boys and girls and we deserve um, a little bit of punishment. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says we're separated from him. 
The Bible says more than we're just separated from him. The Bible says in Romans 5.10 that we are enemies of God and enemies of Christ. And again, the average lost person doesn't necessarily get that, especially if they're depending on their morality to get them to heaven. They're kind of, they kind of think that God's grading on a curve, and at the end of the day, the man upstairs, you know, God's kind of a good old boy up there. He's kind of a cosmic Santa Claus, and as long as I'm not Hitler or Stalin or Timothy McVeigh or some wicked person like that, I'm okay, and just me and him, you know, we're okay. But at the end of the day, they don't understand their sinful nature. And... Um, and, and one of the things that we need to understand is that we are separated and alienated from God. We are enemies of God. Let me tell you something. Before you're saved, if you're sitting here today and you've never been saved, I don't care how moral you are. Let me tell you something about your heart. Your heart is deceitful, desperately wicked above all things. And you can't even know it. Okay? And the Bible says that you've committed high treason against the living God. You're in rebellion against God. So when I talk to you about the doctrine of reconciliation, I'm talking to you about a real objective problem between God who's holy and an unholy man. There is something literally between a holy God and unholy man that will not allow an unholy man to pass and become friends with a holy God. And that chasm is caused because of sin. And so, the sweet doctrine of reconciliation, when we understand that sinful backdrop, and some of you have walked into a jewelry store, uh, maybe not recently, uh, but nevertheless, you've walked into a jewelry store and you'll look down there at the diamonds and the rubies and um, the cubic zirconia, the fake stuff, <laughs> you know, stuff I can afford, and, uh, but you'll look down there at the gold, you'll look down there at the silver, and they've normally got a dark backdrop on that jewelry. They've got light shining down on it. If it's not black velvet, it's, it's crimson. It's dark crimson. But at the end of the day, the reason they put a dark backdrop and they put the lights on there is so that the ruby, the diamond, the gold, the beauty might shine in the jewelry itself. And one of the reasons the gospel of Jesus Christ is not shining in your heart, one of the reasons you're not praising God and rejoicing more over the doctrine of God's salvation by grace through faith and the doctrine of substitution as we talked about two weeks ago and today the doctrine of reconciliation is because you don't understand the sinful backdrop. You don't understand how depraved humanity is and what God had to do in order to initiate your reconciliation. You see, man is so depraved and sinful, he runs away from God, and there's absolutely nothing that humanity can do. So, Brother Vernon, I'll start going to church. Not enough to overcome the chasm. Brother Vernon, I'll cut drinking and smoking. That'll help. Not enough to overcome the chasm. Brother Vernon, I'll give everything I have to the poor. I'll start being a more uh, charitable person. Not enough to overcome the chasm. Brother Vernon, I'll clean up my language. I'll do this. I'll do that. Ladies and gentlemen, nothing that we can do can, can cross that chasm. The Bible says that everything we do as a sinner is tainted by sin. Okay? And so I invite you over to my house. Okay? Um, we're going to have we're gonna have a salad, a tossed salad. I hope you don't mind it, but uh, one of the things that I, I major in as I invite you over is I'm going to cook something out there on the smoker, but I can't wait for you to get a hold of some of my tossed salad. I, I'm going to make you some fresh tossed salad. And I go down and I buy all of the ingredients. I go down to the Reese's or Walmart or whatever, and I buy, I, I buy the freshest ingredients. I go over there, to, uh, you know, over there in Wagner where they sell all the peaches and everything, and I mean, I get all these fresh ingredients, and I invite you over, and um, you're sitting there at the bar, and um, the, 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 the meat's out there on the smoker, it's smoking, you know it's getting close to uh, fruition, get, I'm getting ready to cut that meat, but boy, you see me pull out um, all of those fresh ingredients, and um, you see me cut those fresh ingredients as I'm cutting some of those tomatoes. And as I'm uh, dicing um, some of that lettuce, you realize that on the side of my hand, I've got a, a, a large scab that's been torn open, a sore, and um, it's oozing pus. I mean, it is just nasty. It's obviously infected. Okay, and you see me, I'm sitting there cutting it. You don't want to say anything about it necessarily. But um, after I cut everything, I throw the ingredients in a large bowl. And then you see me not put on any kind of protection in terms of my hands, but you see me take my hands and, and uh, you see me reach down and I start tossing that salad. 
And I'm just tossing it. And, it's just, and I mean, man, it's, it's all the ingredients look so good. But you know that I've touched that salad. And at the end of the day, I said it before you. What do you want to do with that salad that I've just tossed? Yeah. That's an understatement. You don't want anything to do with it. Why? Because my hands have tainted it. It doesn't matter how fresh, okay, the salad is. It doesn't matter how good it might taste. At the end of the day, the very fact that I touched it with a sore on my hand actually contaminates it. And everything that I touch like that is going to be contaminated. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the picture of sin. That's the picture of the sinner. The Bible even goes on to say that when a sinner plows a field... That field is a sin unto God. Everything we touch apart from Christ is a sin when it's offered up to God. And that's what kind of alienation that I'm talking about. We don't understand the depravity of man, the sinful state of humanity before our salvation. Some of us don't even understand it after our salvation. We just thought we were kind of bad. We kind of broke a few of God's laws. And that God did us a wild favor by forgiving us of a few sins. No, we were totally depraved, sinful human beings, and we were headed to a burning inferno called hell. We were uh, hell-bent, and we were hell-bound. And we were hopeless, and we were helpless in that condition. And there was an objective chasm in between a holy God and an unholy man. Do you understand that? Whether you're saved at 6 or whether you're saved at 60 after 60 years plus of running with the devil and serving um, um, the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I, and I. Whether you understand that at 60 and you're saved or whether you understand that at 6, the same person at 6 is as depraved and sinful as the person who's 60 years of age. You understand that in terms of the heart. And the contamination of the heart. And so, God reconciles us to Himself five different times. He is the one, first of all, that takes the initiative. Not only do you have here separation and alienation, you have salvation and you have reconciliation. God is the one that removes the obstacle of sin. And I want you to understand that He is the one that builds a cross so that He might grab in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was 100% man. He was 100% God. God is the one who initiates salvation. Man did not initiate it. Adam and Eve did not cry out for salvation. We do not cry out for salvation. In fact, what we desire is rebellion. We love darkness rather than light, John chapter 1. We have a proclivity of sin. We commit high treason against God and we like it. And that's the direction of our lives. But God says, even though Adam and Eve, you fell, your descendants fell in you and will fall after you. God says, I'm going to remedy the problem. Yes, there's separation and there's alienation. But God says, I'm going to give you salvation and reconciliation. And so there is a chasm caused by sin but God is the initiator this is grace Adam and Eve don't they don't deserve it we don't deserve it when God comes to us in the cool of the day and the way that God reconciles an unholy man with himself who is holy is he sends Jesus Christ who's fully God and he's fully man now you see now brother Vernon Jesus was 50 50 no he was 100 percent God And he was 100% man. And what does Jesus Christ do? He lives a sinless life. He lives a life that we could never live. He dies a death we could never pay. And Jesus Christ on the cross, through his humanity and also through his deity, he takes humanity in one hand who's sinful because he takes our sin upon himself and he took on our sin upon himself. He takes humanity in one hand. And by the way, that's the reason the cross is like this. That's the reason he's suspended between heaven and earth because he's God um, um, uh, reaching down to man and he's man reaching up to God. He takes humanity in one hand. He takes deity in the other hand and through the cross he reconciles us to God. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know there's nothing more uh, uh, um, 
nothing more humbling than the fact that Jesus Christ took our sin upon, upon Himself and the cross became man's greatest plus sign. God took two pieces of timber and He built a bridge. God makes a way for us to have fellowship with sinful, uh, with, with a holy God. And I love it. I love the fact that God allows us to be reconciled to Him. You remember the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son runs away from the father. But then he comes to himself and he goes back to the father. That's the doctrine of reconciliation. The father has no reason to receive the son back. But why does he do it? Because of love. And because of mercy, you're loved by a merciful God. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, there are pictures of reconciliation all over the, uh, the, the Bible. Whereas God is reaching down to man and giving us something that we don't deserve. If there's a love, people, it's us. You know, I saw something very strange the other day. I was coming back from my my little jog and I was driving down the road there and I was right near uh, Broken Arrow NSU and there's a running trail there there's some trails there but um, I caught something in my truck that it's a little bit hard for me to describe but let me see if I can I can tell you what I saw okay so there's a man on the trail and he's walking two dogs he's barefooted I don't know why I noticed that but I thought that was a little bit odd but he's walking two dogs. I assume they were his. One of them was a, a larger dog than the other one. Um, the larger dog, which was sort of like a, a pit bull type of dog, uh, just really big, really muscular. Um, but, I mean, he wasn't, you know, he was happy as they get. You know, you could just tell. He got off of his leash. And so he takes off. He, I mean, he's running. Full blast. He's a big boy. He's just getting after it. His tongue's hanging out, you know. You can tell he's, he's, he's just having a blast. And so I see this man that's barefooted with one dog and a leash, you know, and a second leash that's just, he's now just got in his hand. I see him chasing after this dog barefooted. And I mean, there's no way that he's going to be able to catch his dog that's on the loose. And that dog is just running full blast up the trail. I mean, he's just, he's getting after it. And so I saw literally a car stop up the trail, stopped, kind of pulled off into the NSU parking lot right there. And I saw a guy who saw the same scene I did get out of his vehicle. He got out of his vehicle and he stood there as the dog was running towards him. He stood there and he caught the dog. He, he caught the dog. He was holding the dog and he was waiting so he could reconcile the dog back to his owner. Okay? And I drove on past and I saw exactly what was about to happen. And I know that that owner was so grateful that that man stopped and helped him catch his dog. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the doctrine of reconciliation. You and I, we're running away from God. You and I broke free of the restraints of God. We broke every single one of God's laws. By the way, every single person in here has broken every one of the Ten Commandments. Numerous times. If not physically, in your mind and in your heart. That's how depraved your heart is. And so we broke free of God's commandments. And we did our own things. And we, were, we thought we were liberated. And we were running away from God. But I want to tell you something about our triune God. He has a way of bringing us to himself. And so out in front of us, hallelujah, out in front of us, he sends Jesus. Are y'all listening to me today? Jesus Christ leaves heaven, steps out of heaven, comes down to earth, dies on a cross. And even as we were running away from the Father, Jesus Christ, by his grace, corrals us. And captures us with his precious blood. And he takes us and he delivers us back to the Father. And by the way, being reconciled to the Father is not bondage. Being reconciled to the Father through Christ is liberation. And ladies and gentlemen, that's the doctrine of reconciliation. We were running away from God, but God in his grace, he captures us. And so how do we respond? How does Paul talking about responding to reconciliation here he responds by saying that we worship God 
I mean, you have separation and alienation. You have salvation and you have reconciliation. But you also have, in terms of, of application, adoration and application. How do you respond to that? How do you respond to the fact that God reconciled you to himself through the Lord Jesus Christ? Here's how I respond. You ready? That's it. You respond through worship. You bow the knee. You come to a place where you understand you are running away from God, wildly running away from God, and He captures you by grace, and He delivers you to God the Father. And you have a personal relationship with God, and all you can do is step back and just worship the living God. Not only that, not only do you worship God, not only are you in awe of God, not only are you blown away with God's grace, and His goodness, and His mercy in your life. But then you also turn around and you become a minister of reconciliation. We were reconciled to reconcile. Look at what Paul says. I won't, I won't walk you through it slowly, but look what he says. Now all these things are from God. God did what? Reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Who's got the ministry of reconciliation? We do. That's what you were talking about, Brother Roy, was it not this morning? We were reconciled. God captures us by His grace. And then God says, guess what? Somebody else is on the loose. You go after them and you help me um, reconcile that person to myself. And so, being reconciled, we adore Him, we worship Him, we love Him, and then we serve Him by being ambassadors of Christ. Look at what it says here. He gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. He committed to us the word of reconciliation. What's our word? Be reconciled. That's our message to the world. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Hey, don't just call me Brother Byrne. Don't just call me Dr. Shred. Let me give you another title. You ready? Call me Ambassador Charette. And I'll call you Ambassador. You want to know why? We are ambassadors for Christ. You know what an ambassador is? An ambassador is a person that goes on behalf of their country to another country. Okay? Usually with glad tidings or good news from the king. In fact, generally, most ambassadors are there so that they might um, uh, present a peaceful accord uh, for their king. They go on a very peaceful uh, mission. That's what an ambassador is. Guess what? You're an ambassador. From what kingdom? His kingdom. To who? Those that aren't reconciled. God leaves you here to be an ambassador of His. God wants you to leave the place where you are and go to them and let them know that they too can be reconciled to Him. That's our job, okay? Now, we talked about that ad nauseum in Sunday school, and those of you that are backslidden and didn't come to Sunday school uh, weren't reminded of that. Uh, but listen to me. That's our job. Now, let me ask you something. Ambassador, when's the last time you told somebody about Jesus? When's the last time you attempted to share your testimony with a stranger or a lost person, even in your family? When's the last time you did your job? Now, pastor will share with you not to let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. We'll share with you not so I can flex my spiritual muscles and somehow take pride in the fact that I'm being obedient to God. But two different times in the last two weeks, I've attempted to share my faith with a lost person. One of them was tremendously successful. When's the last time you did that? When's the last time God laid it on your heart to be an ambassador? And by the way, there's another time this week God laid it on my heart and I disobeyed. I'm not, I'm not 
I'll, I'll tell you the good and the bad. There are times when God lays it on my heart. And uh, sometimes I'll obey, sometimes I won't. But at the end of the day, I'm grateful that he's working with me and giving me grace. But when's the last time you did that? David Brainerd. A young man. In fact, he died at the age of 29. Saved at 21. Okay, so what, how many years of ministry did he have? Eight years of ministry. Okay, David Brainerd. When we think of Great Awakenings and um, you study when God moved tremendously, I've talked to you about the Welsh Revival, but you study uh, the first Great Awakening. Names come to your mind and your heart. You learn about John Wesley. You learn about George Whitfield. You learn about the great Puritan, maybe one of the last Puritans, um, Jonathan Edwards who preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. And you read about how God blessed New England and what you and I call the East Coast today and how God moved tremendously and how thousands of souls literally gave their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a man that was a contemporary with all of those that I just mentioned by the name of David Brainerd. And David Brainerd never left New England. So I'm not talking about somebody that was a Billy Graham kind of evangelist. I'm just talking about a guy that kind of stayed generally in one area. But here's the thing about David Brainerd. He had a heart for the lost. He read passages like this, and rather than just dismiss them, rather than hearing his pastor preach, rather than just dismissing his pastor and saying, well, I wish the pastor would land the plane by noon today because it's a holiday weekend after, you know, after all. David Brainerd would read passages like this and it burned in his heart that not only was he an ambassador, it burned in his heart that he was to be a minister of reconciliation. Now wait a second. He goes to Yale as a young man and he's kicked out of Yale and not allowed back into Yale. He criticized a professor and he paid the price for it. So now he's an uneducated man that wants to serve the Lord. And to make matters worse, his mother and his father died at a very young age. To make matters worse, not only was he kicked out of school, David Brainerd suffered tremendously emotionally and physically. He had what was called then melancholy. You want to know what that means today? He was depressed. There were times he would go through bouts of depression. And then to make matters worse, he suffered from tuberculosis. He had TB. And yet, David Brainerd got a heart for what you and I call the American Indians. And so right there, uneducated, physically challenged, bad family life, thrown out of college, he goes to the East Coast there, what you and I would call the East Coast, and he goes to a, the different tribal peoples there, and he suffers, and he serves, and he preaches the gospel, and nothing happens. Months at a time, he would literally ride in on his horse three miles or six miles to get to where the natives were. He would preach to them. Nothing would happen. He would get on his horse. He would go back and be so exhausted. Then he would cough up blood before he went to sleep. And he labored and he labored and he labored. He went to different tribes. One time he's there. He's talking to a tribal people and he kneels down to pray. The natives gather around him and they're going to kill him. A snake, a rattlesnake, comes up to David Brainerd while he's praying, raises up as if he's about to strike David Brainerd. The natives are looking at this and they're thinking in their minds, um, our gods are going to take care of this false prophet. They're thinking in their minds, his God is about to forsake him. That snake raises up puts his little forked tongue out towards David Brainerd a number of times and all of a sudden draws back and slithers off into the woods. And the natives say, that must be a man of God. And they receive him as a prophet. A little bit later, he's preaching and finally he gets the breakthrough that he was looking for. I mean, we're talking about a man 
that labored and labored and labored, died at the age of 29, spent. So many of you, you want to burn your candle down to the very end and you think, well, then I'll give my life to God. Then I'll serve God at the very end. And so your idea is you're going to blow the smoke back in God's face. David Brainerd said, no, I'm not going to give you a little bit of my life. I'm going to give you all of my life. Eight years of ministry, three years to the Native Americans. He finally died. He was the one that impacted Jonathan Edwards. He was the one that impacted William Carey. He was the one that impacted what you and I call the modern day missions movement. I couldn't help as I read that to think about little sweet Hannah. And I'm not just saying that because mama's in the house and daddy's in the house. But I couldn't help but think about that young lady that's serving right now from our church. And how God de de delights to just use young adults that will just sell out to him. And go even an unconventional way to be obedient to God. And I pray that God would give us more Hannah's and others in our church that understand I am an ambassador I am somebody that's supposed to be on mission uh, from God. And you're saying, now, Brother Brian, now, wait a second. I just work in the school system. Exactly. Do you get it? You're a missionary in the school system. I'm a missionary here in Coeta in my church. And whether you have a vocational ministry or not, you are a missionary. You're supposed to be serving as an ambassador. And so therefore, David Brainerd, near the end of his life, challenges you and I with this. We should always look up. This is what he wrote on January 2nd, 1744 in his journal. He, he said this, we should always look upon ourselves as God's servants, placed in God's world to do his work. He says, and accordingly labor faithfully for him. And then Brainerd said, let it then be your great concern and thus devote yourself to God and to, and to His ministry. Ladies and gentlemen, we're called to go. We're called to give. We're called to serve. That's why we are here. Yes, we are called to suffer. Peter 3, 18. When Peter said that Jesus not only was our substitute, the just for the unjust, when Peter said Jesus was the one who reconciles us, that he brings us to God, Peter was not telling us that in a context of health, wealth, and prosperity. When you read 1 Peter, you're talking about a suffering people, and you're talking about Peter saying, we need to be willing to suffer to be an ambassador for Christ. And what he's saying is, is Jesus is the ultimate example. He leaves heaven, and He comes to earth. He takes His crown. He takes his royal robes. He lays aside his glory, Paul says. And he's born in a cave. Oh, it's, it's not like the nativities that you have uh, there on your fireplace. You want to know what, what, what it looked like? It was a filthy cave full of dung, flies. A place where cattle and sheep and goats and animals are kept. He's laid in a manger. He's not born in a manger. He's, he's, he's laid in a feeding trough. His first clothes are the clothes of a peasant. He's wrapped in swaddling clothes. He's raised by two parents. Most likely Joseph dies early. Just a carpenter. Meager raising there in Nazareth. Born in Bethlehem and raised in, in Nazareth ostracized and rejected of men. He said when he started his public ministry, the birds, they have nests, the foxes, they have holes, but I don't even have a place to lay my head. I mean, we're talking about a man that was ostracized and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he came and he lived a sinless life. He was misunderstood. He was rejected. He was lied on. He was ultimately murdered. Even though he was a just and righteous man. He hung on a cross naked for six long agonizing hours. Taking our sin upon himself. He 
suffered. Why? Because he was a minister of reconciliation. He died like that. And you and I won't even walk across the street. He did that. And you and I won't even pony up a dime out of every dollar. Much of that going to missions. He did that. And you and I talk about what a sacrifice it is to come to church for Sunday school or Sunday night, or Wednesday night, or whatever it might be. He did all that so that he might reach the world. And you and I very rarely in our 21st century American culture make any kind of true sacrifices for the Lord. And we sit here self-righteously, and we talk about the Bible, and we talk about how good we are, and how great we are, this, that, and the other. And at the end of the day, God is saying, you've missed it. You rest in my salvation, and you enjoy my fellowship, but also don't forget who you are in me. And at the end of the day, I think our loving God is simply saying this, get to work. Get to work. He lies there dying. TB is consuming him. Brainerd is being ministered to by Jonathan Edwards' daughter, who's 11 years younger than him. Near the end of his death, they fell in love. She writes, and I'm not going to, I've got it, I could read it to you, but she writes his last hours and his last days. Um, Jonathan Edwards preached on it, shared it. Basically, David Brainerd, in his last hours, struggling you know how wicked tuberculosis is to die from in that day with that modern day medical medicine and that type of thing i mean it's horrible and he is struggling and he says it's like breathing a thousand last breaths and he is longing to be with his savior at the end of the day He is feeling guilty because he's saying to himself, and he utters this to his sweet girlfriend there, I don't want to end my life longing for heaven if God would ordain me to stay even one moment longer on this earth. More than anything, I long for you. And then he began to utter under his breath, Lord Jesus, soon I'll be with you. Lord Jesus, soon I'll be worshiping with the angels with you in heaven. And he utters it and he utters it and he utters it. And finally, he slips off. Ladies and gentlemen, it's nine years of ministry, spiritual life. It's only three years of ministry done in New England. But I want you to know Jesus Christ received him into his eternal kingdom and it was all worth it. It will be worth it. Stand with me. All over the auditorium. Father, our hearts are moved by your word today, not by the pathos of a preacher, not by the ability for a preacher that has studied homiletics and rhetoric to move our hearts. Father, we're moved today by your word. You said that you sent Christ so that we might be reconciled to you. You said that you sent Christ to reconcile us and to give us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God is saying this to the sinner through us, be reconciled to God. Lord, we just want to admit as a church, some of us, and I know, Lord, many of us in here, we have made some sacrifices, and I'm grateful for it. But Father, we've not done all yet. 
We've not done all. Starting where I'm standing. So Lord, I ask you. Work a great work of grace in our hearts and in our lives. Make us willing to pay the price and be used tremendously by you. It might be expected of a church in Tulsa, might be expected of a church in Muskogee or one of these larger cities, whatever it might be, for you to use a church that has a lot of money you to use a church that's got a better location. You to use a church that's got more power players in it. Father, at the end of the day, I'm glad that you are willing to use anybody that's simply willing to take what little they have and surrender it to you. And God, we surrender our lives right now. We surrender our hearts. I surrender my pocketbook, my checkbook, my wallet. I surrender my time, my talent, my treasures to you. God, forgive me for being selfish. Forgive us as a church for being so myopic in terms of self-centeredness and just thinking that it's really about us. It's really about my generation, my age group, my power within the church, when at the end of the day, those are things that you could care less about. It's really about the lost. And you reaching them through us. And Father, would you just cause our congregation to catch a glimpse of what you might through not do through not me as the preacher or the staff. But Father, you might allow some of our deacons or some of our laymen to catch a glimpse of what you might do through them to impact the nations for your glory whether they be young or old or male or female, God, I know that you can use all of us. We've got people situated in our church as teachers, some of them as administrators. Uh, we've got people in our church that are housewives, moms, dads. We've got grandparents, people in our church that are serving in retirement communities, and they have lost people all around them. I mean, God, you've placed us everywhere. And God, you've given us an opportunity to be ambassadors for you. Do it now, Jesus. Do it now. Do it for your glory. Now, ladies and gentlemen, with every head bowed, every eye closed, you need to trust in Jesus. I'm, I'm not going to be here a moment longer, a minute longer, I promise. This is what I want to say. If you need to trust Jesus right there, call out to him. Say, Lord, save me. Jesus, I had no idea about the doctrine of substitution. I had no idea about the doctrine of reconciliation. Thank you for coming to me and convicting me and removing the pediment between you and I called sin through Jesus. And Father, thank you for saving me. I give you my life right now. Is there anybody that prayed that? Stick up your hand and say, Brother Burn, I trusted in Christ just now. And I'm saved and I just want to praise God for it. Stick up your hand and say, Brother Burn, just gave my life to Jesus. Anyone? That means we're all ambassadors. Student? You're an ambassador. We're ambassadors. I'm going to pray. And when I say amen, we're going to be dismissed. I want you to leave here. And I want you to remember, as you walk out that exit door, you're not exiting to go enjoy the rest of your holiday. Although I hope you have a great, great holiday. You're exiting to go to the mission field. Some of you are going to rub shoulders with a family member around a barbecue pit tomorrow that needs to hear the gospel of Christ. Some of you, you can't get a hold of them physically, but you're going to pray. I don't care if they're in California. I don't care if that lost person is down in Florida. I don't care if they're in New York. I don't care if they're up in Alaska. I don't care if they're in Hawaii. I don't care if they're over the Middle East. You can pray for them.